want you to open up your Bibles back to the book of James. James chapter 1, my message this morning is entitled, Discerning or Double-Minded. Discerning or Double-Minded. Now, I had planned on preaching a one-part message, but I don't know how the Spirit of God moves me. There's some things I've been thinking about as I've been kind of rolling around in my mind, so we'll find out what happens. James chapter 1, we're going to read verses... um, I think we'll read verses 5 through 8. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Discerning or double-minded. Beginning with verse number 5, James says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable, not just in a few waves, but where? Always it affects every area and aspect of his being. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the infallible Word of God. And Lord, as we study these texts, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, the breath of heaven. And Father, you'd open up the text to us and help us apply them to our lives. that We may draw nigh unto thee as you draw nigh unto us, as James says in chapter 4. Father, I pray you loosen the strings of my tongue. Bless thy people. Grant us understanding, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, here James speaks on the manner in which a believer may react when his faith is severely tested by the various trials and temptations may come into our life. In fact, look at verses 2 through 4. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Why, James? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire And he says, wanting nothing. Now here we're shown the moral and spiritual value of temptations and trials, beloved, when they come into our life. And James is showing us that as Christians, we're always either in the forge or on the anvil as God is trying to either pound out or burn out that moral and spiritual dross that's in our life. But beloved, we can be thankful for this, that we know that our almighty God, even though we may be in the furnace of affliction, He has his hand, his omnipotent hand, on the thermostat. He turns the heat up or he turns the heat down. Why? As he deems fit, as he sees as necessary for our moral and spiritual growth so we can go from babies in the faith to uh, spiritually mature adults in the faith. Amen? Now, now, beloved, it's a a sad thing. Uh, The Bible says, count it all joy. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't count it all joy when my feet are in the fire, do you? I'm trying to learn how to do that. I don't count it all joy when my back's aching or something else has gone wrong in my life, but I'm understanding this truth more and more in my life. God is using the laboratory of life to work things out in me so I can be a better man, a better Christian, a better preacher, a better minister. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God is always at work in our life. Philippians 1.6 says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work, and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And I've told you, you may forget about that blessed truth, but God never forgets about it. Amen? God is always at work in our life, even when we feel isolated, even when Satan makes us feel lonely, beloved. God is using that for his glory and for our benefit. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, so James exhorts us here to be joyful and not be discouraged when these trials and temptations come into our life. Why? Because we know that God is using them to morally and spiritually, now listen to me, mature, improve us as his children. We come to Christ with a lot of baggage, and we have to have that baggage cleaned out. Uh, A lot of people are like hoarders in their life. You know, a hoarder will take newspapers, and, and they just, I'll use this time and I'll use this another time and then you're trying to get through the house and you're like this like this and I get stacks and stacks of this that and the other thing 
And we do that in our life with a lot of things. And God says we've got to clean out the house. See, so God puts us in the furnace of affliction a lot of times to do that. Not because he's trying to punish us, but because he's trying to mature and improve his children. Would you say amen out there? Why? Because God is using this furnace of affliction to cultivate and confirm the needful perseverance and uh, persistence in the faith. Beloved, we need to persevere. Listen to me. We need to learn how to hang in and hold on. Amen? And a lot of times, people don't learn that. And so God says, I'm going to teach it to you. And so God allows a trial to come into our lives so we can learn it. Other times, beloved, he does it to help us go and grow as Christians. You know, we talk about the go of the gospel. Well, that's what God always wants us to do is keep on going on, pressing on that up with way and new heights we're gaining every day. So James assures us that whenever we're in the furnace of affliction, Almighty God is still in control in our life. It is not the pain. It is not the problem. It is not what's going on. You see, beloved, we just have to endure it, knowing that God is in sovereign control of it. Would you say amen? God is always in charge of our life. Now, Paul echoes this divine truth, beloved. And he says this to us in Romans 8.28. And we know. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God is the great architect of our life. I preached a sermon to you one time on God making biscuits with our life, and I used Romans 8.28. That God is always at work doing those things. And again in 2 Corinthians 4.17, Paul says this. Now listen. He says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction, Pastor, do you know what's wrong with my body? God says, compared to eternity, it's nothing. Amen? That's a cross you're going to have to learn to bear. You, you say you don't understand the financial situation I'm in. God says, don't worry about it. i got a mansion for you in the sky, and you don't have to pay taxes on it either. Oh, by the way, your driveway has gold in the street. <laughs> I'll take that. How about you? And so Paul kind of concludes what he's saying uh, about this, beloved, in Romans 8, uh, 18. And he says this, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be con compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you. You know, Paul was a cowboy. Did you know that? Well, I reckon, pilgrim, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to wrestle me a grizzly and kiss me a pretty girl, and I hope I don't mix it up. Okay. But, beloved, what I'm saying is James gives us two contrasting ways in which we may react when we encounter the difficult trials and troubles in our life. Now, I want you to look at verse 5, right through to verse 6a, and then we're going to drop down to verse 8. He says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, ladies and gentlemen, through faith, we can either ask God for wisdom to be discerning when we face life's trials and problems in our life, so we can be victorious, so we can be overcome in the spiritual battle, or we can become like Christian atheists. You say, Christian atheist, Pastor Joel, that sounds like an oxymoron. It is. A Christian atheist is someone who doesn't have enough faith, beloved, to keep on asking God, Lord, I need wisdom, I need discernment, I need wisdom, I need discernment. And a lot of times we think, we think we can do it ourselves, that we're smart enough ourselves. This is what James is talking about here, that we need to understand something about this wisdom. Because our wisdom can't get us through all of the trials, troubles, and tribulations that we are going to face in our life. Now, it's amazing what we can adapt to. We look around, we see unsaved people adapting to things. But you know something, beloved? God has got something greater for his children. Amen? And God is saying, I don't want you to adapt the way the, Lord, uh, the world does. I want you to adapt the way I'm teaching you to. That's what God wants us to do in our life. So what am I saying to you, beloved? If you don't, if you don't ask God for wisdom, if you don't ask God for discernment, then you won't be an overcomer in the spiritual battle. You'll be a succumber. You won't be victorious in the spiritual battle. You will be defeated. 
Either God is Lord of your life and Lord of all, or He's not Lord at all in your life. Amen? He's only your Savior. And you're the Lord. You're sitting on the throne of your heart. You're ruling and reigning over, the, over your life and not the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be Lord. Kurios. Kurios is the Greek word. Lord, Lord. So James here rebukes double-minded doubters and compares them to being unstable and unsteady. And he says they're like the restless and agitated waves of the sea. Why? Because they don't trust God enough to ask him for wisdom to deliver them through all of their difficulties. Well, I'm just going to call the doctor, and I'm just going to call the lawyer, and I'm just going to call this one, and I'm just going to call that one. Eleven, we should step back and say, Lord, first of all, I want to know why this came into my life. And if you don't tell me why, tell me what should I do, and tell me who I should go see about it. But he is in control, amen? Not just, I, I think I'll just run to the lawyer, or I'll just run down here to this person. I'll, I'll run over there to that doctor. Oh, beloved, you know, we all say Christ is the great physician. Oh, yes, he is. But I want to tell you something. Before anything goes wrong, in my, before I ever go to a doctor, or I ever go to a lawyer, I always on my face and saying, Lord, what is this all about? What is it thou would have me to do? And then I find out what it is that he wants me to do. Now, I want you to look at verse 6b through 8. He says, For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Now, verse 7, For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Did you see that, ladies and gentlemen? He's telling us that folks like this receive absolutely nothing from the Lord. Notice what he says there, beloved, in verse 6b. He says, For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. Now, you may think you're going to receive something from the Lord, but God says you need to get your thinking square. I won't give it to you. Now, is God just trying to be mean to us? No, ladies and gentlemen, he's trying to teach us some things. Would you say Amen. Oh, he's trying to teach us how powerful this book is, how powerful his words are. They have life in them, ladies and gentlemen. And God says, choose life, choose life, choose life. This is a powerful book. This isn't Reader's Digest. This isn't modern romance. This is the word of the Lord. Would you say amen? So I want you to note their moral and spiritual instability when pressures and problems come into their life. The Bible says they waver. And they doubt because they don't have enough faith to trust that God will answer their prayer and give them the wisdom that they need to help them through their dilemmas. Listen to me, beloved. Listen to me now. So many people base their convictions on quaint little sayings that other people say, which has no place in a Christian's life unless it meets uh, uh, measures up according to what the Word of God has to say. Amen? Listen to me now. The Holy Spirit doesn't doubt it like this will bore his work, nor reward them in their unbelief of God's supernatural power and God's supernatural abilities. Beloved, listen to me. Christianity is a supernatural religion. And I'm not talking about the way the Pentecostals believe or the Charismatics believe. I'm talking about the way God believes. Amen? It's a supernatural religion. And God works supernaturally. And when you got converted, it was supernatural. And when the Holy Spirit came in you, it was supernatural. And God has said, I won't, I won't answer your prayer if you're a doubter like that. I won't do it. If you're double-minded, I will not do it. Now, am I making that up or does God himself say that? You listen to me. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, But without faith, for without faith, he says, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Did you hear that? Beloved, I, I don't know if it's my nature the way God made me, but when I get an interest in something, I will pursue it to the nth degree. My, my wife would tell you, I, she'll say, Joel, why don't you lay down the sword? Why don't you quit right now? I say, I can't, Ellie. I'm driven. I, Joel will come to bed. Plenty of time for sleeping when you're dead. I, I've got to study. This. I've got to know this. I've got to do that. I, and see, beloved, God says, that is what I want you to do with me. I don't want you just to seek me. I want you to what? Diligently seek me. Like when you fall in love. You know the first time you met that girl and she blagged her eyes to you? 
That was it. You were done. And then you looked at her and you said, well, I've got to meet this girl again. And then all day you were thinking about her. And then you get on the horn. Hi. Oh, oh, I just, did I leave my wallet when we were out for tea today? No, you didn't. <laughs> and then you call them up and you can't wait to see them. You see, you're, you're starting to diligently pursue this person. There's a deep interest now. God says, that's what I want from you. I want you to have a deep interest in me. Not just an interest. I want it to be the number one priority, the number one interest of your life. So you will diligently seek me. Amen. And you hear me now. Those who do not diligently seek the Lord for wisdom will receive little or no help from heaven to guide them through all of the trials or all of the tough times in life. You will have to do this by yourself in your own strength. Now, I know people say, well, you know, God he pities us. Yes, he does, beloved. For those who fear him, those who pursue him, those who diligently seek after him. Oh, beloved, is he your first love now? I pray he is. I pray you have not lost your first love or left your first love. You see, beloved, what God is saying to you, if you don't do this, you're going to have to go through uh, all of these trials with your own shallow and superficial wisdom of your own fallen, feeble, finite mind. And that little strength that you think you have, that as you get older, it ebbs away. I was talking to a brother one time, and we were talking about one of the things you miss when you get older is your strength. Things that you took for granted, beloved. You can lift up, pick up, do whatever you're going to do, go out, and then all of a sudden you realize you've got the desire from here up, but the, not the ability from here down. And you see, beloved, that's what will happen if you do not beseech God diligently, you are going to do it on your own strength that is waning away every day as you're getting older. <clears throat> and you don't want that to happen in your life, amen? So God doesn't want you to become a succumber, beloved. He wants you to be an overcomer in the spiritual battle and all of the difficulties that you may face in your life. That's God's will for your life. Yet James reveals that God does not want you to suffer like this. It is not God's will, beloved, for His people. He wants us to be able to constantly and continuously access heaven's resources uh, to defeat every foe, every denizen of hell, and all of the difficulties that Satan himself may send your way. God says you can't do it on your own. You need to be able to access my power, my spirit, my grace, my mercy. You need to be able to do that. Hey, that's my will for your life. That's my plan that I had for you. Those are the good things that I've thought about you. But you hear me now. Doubters have very little confidence in God's supernatural person or power. Oh, I believe he's out there and I believe he has power, you know, but that was during the days of the apostles. You see, beloved, doubters have very little confidence in God's promises or God's providence that he will put the right person in the right place at the right time in your life. Would you say Amen. You think we're all here by accident today? You folks watching by television or tuned in, do you think you're by accident today? Or is it the providential hand of God, supernaturally moving behind the scenes, ruling and overruling in the everyday affairs of your life? I think it is all about you. But beloved, why is it they have very little confidence in God's personal power, promises, or providence? Why is it? What is it, Pastor Joel? Because beloved, they get it backwards. They what? They get it backwards. They get what backwards? Whereas Scripture says they were to walk by faith and not by sight, beloved. They do the exact opposite. They walk by sight and not by faith when these afflictions and problems and adversities come into their life. And so therefore, beloved, they have to lean on the omnipotent, uh, the, excuse me, the impotent arm of flesh. They're on the omnipotent arm of God, they have to lean on the impotent arm of their own flesh or the flesh of someone else. You see, they trust in their own strength, their own wisdom, their own knowledge. And these doubters like this, they trust in their own education or experience, or they trust in their own family, or they trust in their own friends, or their own skills, their own training, or those of others, beloved. And yet, these people are as fallen, as frail, and feeble as you are. They're mortal. God alone is immortal. In the light, uh, Paul said, 
uh, the young pastor Timothy. Now listen to me. What does God have to say about this? Listen now. Yet God says, don't do that. Cease ye from men. That's what he said in the book of Isaiah. Cease ye from men. Stop trusting in men. Beloved, God says, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and make his flesh his arm. God says it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And by the way, princes could be anyone else. Amen? The very center verse of the Bible, Psalm 118.8, the Bible says this, It is better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in man. The center verse of the Bible, beloved, you think that was by accident? It's better to trust in the Lord than put your confidence in man. Now, that's, it's staggering when you think the providential hand of God. Forty different writers over a period of about 1,600 years write the Bible. A lot of them never met one another. And yet here's this center verse right smack dab in the middle of the Bible. Why? Because God wants us to trust him. Amen. I want you to listen to me. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says this. That God has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the, escaped the lust of the world, uh, or the flesh of the world. Well, you know what I'm saying. God has given us some great and accession, uh, uh, some big promises. God has given us some big promises, beloved. And you know what? I'm a mortal man. But I want to tell you something I always try to do. If I promise someone something, I try to hold to it as much as I can. I'm frail, but I want to tell you something. I make it uh, my word. I want it to be my bond. That's what I grew up on. That's what my dad taught me. That's where it used to be. Your word was your bond. And God's word is his bond. And God promises, I'll help you. I'll give you wisdom. I'll sustain you. I'll make you a great discerner. I'll make you so you're never double-minded in your life. And yet people can't even get out of their own way sometimes. You see, James tells us the believers, uh, that the believer is not left to fight the trials and temptations of life by himself. You know, the Bible says this, the battle is the Lord's. You know, the Bible says the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. The Bible says, ladies and gentlemen, it's not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Would you say amen out there? You see, folks, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul said this, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way for you to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now, that's powerful, Amen. Because James is talking about temptations and trials here, and God says, don't worry about it, i got it covered for you. When you're in a trial, when you're in a temptation, I'm there too, and I'll make a way for you to escape, but you have to take it. I'll give you the grace and the strength and the wisdom to, to bear it up, but you have to come to me. Don't trust in yourself. If you trust in yourself, you're a fool, the Bible says. Always trust in the Lord, amen. You see, beloved, sadly, when we so often doubt the Lord's power and promises, then he allows experience to become our teacher. Now, experience is a great teacher, I have to tell you. But why does God allow experience now to become our teacher? Because first, it gives us the painful reality of our actions, and then it teaches us the principles of the lesson, right? Now, normally you want that reversed. You want to sit down and be able to study the principles, learn the lesson, and then you go out and apply it in life. God says, you don't listen to me now. I'm going to let your feet be put right smack dab in the fire. Boy, I'm going to let pain come over you. Boy, am I going to let problems come into your life. And then I'll teach you why. Now, I wanted to do it the other way. <laughs> but you wouldn't listen. You wouldn't come to me. You wouldn't pray. You wouldn't ask me for the wisdom that you needed. You didn't want to be a discerner. You thought you had it covered through your own flesh. And, beloved, I'm for education. i got to tell you, I'm for education. But a lot of people have made education their God instead of making God their real education. Amen? Oh, if you could only understand the word of the Lord. Are you listening to me? It's a sad fact that ju good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Amen? 
Now that's a sad fact. Now there's some terms that we need to define and understand here that I want to call your attention to. What does the words discerning and double-minded mean? Now let's take the word discerning, beloved. A discerning person is someone who has a sharp and shrewd judgment. In other words, they're very perceptive. And they have profound insight into things, beloved, and they can see deep enough into something to separate truth from error. They can see aspects of something that they never thought before. Why? Because they're wise. They're discerning. You hear me. Therefore, beloved, they're able to correctly assess a situation and make sound decisions and then take the right and most beneficial course of action. Why? Because they are discerning. And a discerning person is usually known as a very wise person. I remember years ago when I was a young buck. That was about five years ago. I remember, beloved, when an old timer would walk into the room, someone aged, elderly, gray hair, white hair. You know what we'd do? Just like in the book of Job, we'd stand up. When they would come in, they'd take their seat, then we'd sit down. You know why? Not only did they respect the person, but they respect the years of wisdom that they had gained from all of their experiences. Oh, that would be such a blessing to see people do that today, wouldn't it? Especially when we're euthanizing our senior citizens. I don't want to go there because uh, I could preach a sermon on that. But God says, I want you, my will for your life is that you become very wise and that you become very discerning. If you're thinking, I'm smart enough, I've got a college education, you don't know the kind of job I do, you've already defeated yourself. God is saying to you, who gave you the wisdom to be able to pursue that career? Who opened up the door for you to be able to work where you're working right now? Who's the one who's delivered you through all of these different things that you've been in your life? Is it your job? Is it your boss? Is it yourself? Is it your knowledge? Is it your lawyer? Is it your doctor? Or is it me? Amen? The older you get, the more you see your own mortality, don't you? You folks know what I'm talking about if you're my age. You see how weak you can really get. You see how one little microscopic virus or bacteria can put you flat on your back and kill you. You don't take anything for granted in your life, do you? So that's the discerning person, beloved. Now, what do we mean by a double-minded person? Look at verse number 8. He says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Now, the word double-minded, dipsukos, is the Greek word. It means a twofold, two-souled, two-spirited man. One who is so unsure of himself or what they do, that what they do is they oscillate and they vacillate. And they fluctuate back and forth between two totally different opinions and decisions. You see, folks, making the right choice or arriving at a correct conclusion and judgment seems to confuse them. And they never really know what to do in any given situation or how to make a proper judgment or decision. And I want you to notice verse 8 says this also, that they are unstable, akatasteos. And that means they're unsound, they're unsure, they're unsteady in their life. They're like jello. If you take jello and you shake it, you see how it wiggles. And that's the way they are in their life. I'm not sure of this, and I'm not sure of my convictions, and I'm not sure of that, and I'm not sure this is going to happen. And they're unsound. Oh, beloved, you need to get your convictions screwed down tight. Know what you believe and believe what you know. So you'll be able to make some decisions in your life. And notice it says here, beloved, that they're shaky and inconsistent. And notice what he says here. En pas autos hodos is the Greek phrase. In all their ways. Not just some of their ways. What does it say? In all of their ways, in every area and aspect of their moral and spiritual life, their personal life, their uh, emotional life, their finance, they're unstable. Should I do that? Should I? No, gee, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, 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 good night. Make a decision. God says, I'll give you the wisdom to be able to do it. And not only be able to do it, be able to do it the right way for the right reason at the right time. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, 
What happens is this affects their attitudes and their actions when they're unstable in all their ways. And it affects their reactions, their interactions, and their decisions, and their judgments. Why? Because they're so afraid to make the wrong decisions that they fail to seize the real opportunities and make the right ones or get the breaks in life that God wants them to have. It's amazing to me. The Bible says we're to walk by faith and not by sight. And yet so many people walk by sight, not by faith. They always play it safe. Now, beloved, I'm not against playing it safe. There are times you play it safe. Amen? But there are other times God says, didn't I call you to this? Didn't I tell you I wanted you, to, I wanted you to do this? But Lord, it just seems so unreasonable. You know, I, it may cost me my income, and what am I going to do? When I got into the ministry, I went through that. I sold my businesses, right? And I said, Lord, you know, you know, you know getting money out of these people, like a uh, screen door or a submarine here, a sealed door. <laughs> you know? But God says, didn't I tell you to do I didn't tell you to take the safe. I told you to trust me by faith, right? And that's what God wants us to do. When you get a queer, uh, queer, whew, clear word of the Lord, act on it. You trust by faith. This is what I want you to do. Some of you may be called to be missionaries. You may have to give up some things. You say, Pastor, I'm going to live hand to mouth. I says, so what? I, I, I got you covered. You see, you're in this for me anyways, aren't you? You're trying to be a better Christian, aren't you? You're trying to be more mature, aren't you? You're trying to be a better servant for me, aren't you? You're judgment bound. You want more uh, rewards, don't you? Has that escaped your attention? I hope not. You know, so they're always wavering between two opinions. I think about Elijah on Mount Carmel. Here's Elijah, one man against 450 prophets of Baal and 400 other prophets. Only we're just going to stay with the 450 right now. The children of Israel had not totally deserted worshiping a Yehovah, a Yahuwah, oh God. What they did was they said, you know what, we're kind of, this is, this is Judaism, and we're going to bring a little bit of Baalism inside it also. And I told you in Sabbath school they worshiped, uh, this morning, uh, the graduation, they worship the right God the wrong way. So God sends the prophet to them. They're not like prophets today. Prophets today tell you what you want to hear. God is going to bless you. His power is upon you. There's seasons of favor coming into your life. Isn't that what the prophets say today? Now, and people buy their books, their DVDs, their CDs, everything else. They probably buy their shoes. I don't know. But can you imagine if this prophet came out and says, Thus saith the Lord, repent ye. They wouldn't sell any books, sell any, sell any CDs, sell any DVDs. So God says to Elijah, I want you to go and confront those 450 prophets of Baal. And oh, by the way, King Ahab and his hussy wife Jezebel. Elijah goes up to Mount Carmel. Now picture this, beloved. And the prophets of Baal, they slay their, their uh, uh, animals, put them on the altar. And all day long, they're calling out to Baal, Oh, Baal, you uh, 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 who rule over our lives, who give us all the blessings in our life. And heaven didn't answer by fire. So about noontime, they started flaying themselves, beating themselves in the back, scraping their backs up, bleeding all over the place. Oh, Baal, oh, and your God did not answer by fire. And Elijah told those prophets, the God who answers by fire, he's the real God. And so they are, here they are all day, and you can just see Elijah kind of cleaning his nails, picking his teeth. Hey, fellas, maybe he's on a trip. He doesn't, hey, I know, he's taking his afternoon siesta. He's taking a nap. He can't hear you. And he kind of Time goes on. Maybe he's in the bathroom right now. He can't hear you. And so by the evening sacrifice, Baal had not answered from heaven. Elijah comes up. Now remember, there was no water in those days. There, there were three years of a drought had happened. Elijah says, I want you to dig a trench around the Lord's altar. The Lord's altar was just rocks that were piled up. He says, dig a trench around it. He says, I want you to go down to the sea, and I want you to fill that trench with water. So they filled it with what? He says, fill it again. They filled it again. He says, fill it again. 
They filled it again. Then he says, I want you to soak the sacrifices in water. Now, can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, Elijah has this confidence in Jehovah, in God, the real God of heaven and earth. And so he stands up and he says, Lord, show them who the real God is. And a bolt of lightning comes down. The Bible says, consumes the sacrifices, consumes the rocks, licks up the water in the trench. And all the people fall down and they start saying, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah steps up. He says, why halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. Why are you all wavering? Why are you always going back and forth? Why are you always oscillating? Are you afraid to make a decision? Do you think your God has left you? That's what he's saying in essence. Now you know the end of the story, ladies and gentlemen. But what I'm saying to you is double-minded people are just like that. You see, beloved, they waver between two, two opinions. One week they say, you know what? I know I'm supposed to be baptized. I know it. The Bible says it. Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now Jesus said it. He didn't say he that is, uh, 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 believes, he's saved already, and then he can get baptized if he wants or doesn't want to. Did, did God say that? Now, I told you last week, if God says he that believes and is baptized shall receive a million dollars, you'd be waiting up in the line here for the baptistry. And so wouldn't I, by the way. <laughs> you'd be waiting right up here. There's no, that's a clear word from the Lord. You see, people oscillate. I know I should, but I don't know if I'm going to do it. Uh, people know they should be in the church, in the Lord's house, on the Lord's day. And they come to church and they hear a message from the Word of God. And when they do, they say, you know what? Pastor Joel scratched me right where I itch. No, that wasn't Pastor Joel. That was the Word of the Lord. That was the Holy Spirit of the living God. Giving you what you need to hear, not want to hear because He loves you. But then you walk out of church and you go home and you go your way and people just comfort you in your backslidden state. And they're going to be held accountable for that, by the way. And if you lose your soul, they're really going to be held accountable for it. Now, I don't know if you're skipping church. I don't know if you need to be baptized. I don't know. I'm using examples as God gives with me off the cuff here. A lot of people know they should repent of their backsliding, but they won't do it. They come, they get convicted. I know i got to stop this. I know I need to get saved or I need to stay saved. And then they walk out. You know what? i I, I got to wait. For it. You know what? I, I, I'll put it off to another time. They procrastinate. Why halt ye between two opinions? See, a real discerner doesn't do that. Someone who can discern the signs of the times knows, I must seize this right now. The opportunity avails itself. Right? I'm going to grasp it right now. It may never come my way again. What if I die right now and I don't grace the doors of God's heaven? Because I know I'm one heartbeat and one breath away from God. And so they halt between two opinions. You see, beloved, listen to me. They're so afraid to make choices. They're so afraid, ladies and gentlemen, to take chances. They're so afraid to trust God or live by faith, beloved, and that they waver back and forth between sound and unsound judgments like a stormy, tempest-tossed wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. You've seen it right down here on the waterfront. Amen? One day they're here, one day they're there, one day they're up, one day they're down, one day they're on fire, next day they're cooled down. How would you like your spouse to see you? You see, folks like this, Constantly second guess themselves. Did I do the right thing? Hey, make a decision and live with it. If your motivation is pure, God will work out the method. Even if you made a mistake, because your motivation is right, you're trusting God. You see, folks like this can't ever seem to make their mind, beloved, nor can they make any commitment. Yeah, I'm really going to be in church. You can trust me. I'm going to get involved with this. But you know, right now, I'm a little tired. My work's kind of overdone. Me out. So your work's before your God, huh? The only time you get to serve your God is right now. The only time. This era of probation, this is it. Your boss will not reward you on the day of judgment. The patients you take care of. You say, Pastor, why are you saying that? Because we've got about 1,000 nurses in here, right? And, and AIDS or whatever. They're not going to reward you. We got a doctor too. The lawyers are not going to be there. God is going to be there. He's going to say, What did you do for me? 
Isn't your job your ministry? Is it supposed to be? You're supposed to put me first. Not the job before me. Me before the job. See, that's wisdom, beloved. That's understanding. I have long foresight. I'm looking down the corridors of time in the far off distant future and I can see where I'm heading, where I'm going, where I'm going to spend eternity and how I'm going to spend eternity. So I better serve God while I can. Amen. I better serve the Lord while I can. Folks like this, often, and I've seen this so many times over the years, they end up doubting their beliefs and believing their doubts. Some people do it for attention. I, I hate to say it. You know, if I just waver back and forth and I always act like I'm afraid and blah, 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 people will cuddle me, cuddle me and be around me all the time and, you know, and they'll feel sorry for me. And, hey, beloved, I don't know about you. I don't want that. People, I want people to respect me for who I am. How about you? I want to trust the Lord. No, my hand goes out. I have sympathy and empathy for those who can't take care of themselves, beloved, or, or are in a, a problem. Of course we do, but they're striving, they're trying. See, they're asking God for wisdom, God for knowledge, God for power, God for strength. See, they're discerning. God himself can serve and work in my life. So listen to me, beloved. Now I want you to get this. The worst decision in life is indecision. Why, Pastor? Because it paralyzes and cripples your mobility in every area and aspect of your life. How many people have I seen over the years say, why didn't I do that? Good night. I should have done that. Let me tell you a quick story. When I come, first got out of the service, uh, we used to have a guy in town. We called him Joe Chicken. Everybody remember Joe Chicken? I won't say his name over the, over the TV. And he used to take care of, of uh, if you had a, a raised chickens and you, you take them to him, he would butcher them. He'd prepare them for you. You could buy turkeys at Thanksgiving. You just got as religious as a turkey at Thanksgiving. But, but anyways... Joe Chicken owned, in Plymouth down here where McDonald's is, that used to be Rob's Root Beer. How many of you remember that? You don't remember that? Boy, am I over the hill, right? And I remember when I was in high school, we, we played football. We had double sessions, so it would be hot as anything. They, see, this is when they weed out the men from the boys in August. So we'd have a morning session. You'd be absolutely soaked, banged, bruised, or whatever. And then we'd rush down to Rob's Root Beer, and they had these big buckets like of... Uh, of Rob's root beer, and we'd put vanilla ice cream in them, we'd suck them all down, and then we'd go back for the, the um, uh, afternoon session. Well, when I got out of the service, Joe Chicken came up to me one day, and he says, hey, Joe, Joey, he always called me Joey, Joey, you want to buy this property here? Now, this was right down here, Room 44. <laughs> what a dummy I was. And I had saved a little bit of money when I was in Vietnam. I, 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 we used to gamble in them days, and uh, I won't go into the rest of it. But I had saved some money. And I said, how much, Joe? He says, $25,000. I says, $25,000. Everything inside me said, buy it, Joel. Buy it, Joel. Buy it, Joel. I says, no, Joe. I says, that's too much for me. Buy it, Joel. Buy it, Joel. Well, Joe Chip sold to McDonald's, and that property is worth probably today about three million bucks. I procrastinated. I put it off. I didn't listen. God himself, I believe, was screaming inside of me and telling me what to do. But see, I didn't have enough discernment in, that, in days. I didn't have enough wisdom or foresight in them days to see the real opportunities that I should have seized. Oh, beloved, can you imagine how much more we'll have now as Christians as God downloads His wisdom into our hearts and into our lives? You see, beloved, so we crippled people like this when they don't, when they find out that the, uh, they, they begin to doubt their beliefs and believe their doubts. So when their own intellect and logic and reasoning fails them, beloved, when their own education or training fails them, when their own human abilities or capability, beloved, their own strength and power and trust in self and others, when it runs out and it fails them, beloved, what do they do? They panic. And sadly, a lot of people quit at that time. Or they end up in animated suspension, just kind of treading water, not going forward 
not going backwards, just kind of hanging in, hanging on. Because they've not learned that God always wants to move us forward. Amen? And suddenly and shockingly, beloved, now what do they do? Now for the first time in their life, and bless me, God, I'm thankful for this. For the first time in their life, they've seen their own inadequacies and insufficiencies and inefficiencies and deficiencies and incompetencies, ladies and gentlemen, and their shortfalls of their own limited human strength and wisdom. And God had to bring them to the end of themselves. Now, my dad used to say to me, John, a wise man learns from other people's mistakes. Isn't that true? But how many of us really do? We're always, because of our fallen nature, we think, I am the one that's going to get away with it. I will escape it. I'll control my own destiny. No one else is going to have to do that. You see, sure, people are dumb enough to let them get, to get themselves entrapped in this, but not me. I'm too smart for that. So they go along and they do their thing, and then they come to an abrupt end and they see they're at the end of themselves, amen? And that it's totally, they're totally, I should say, incapable of logically and deductively and reasonably thinking through some terrible, uh, distressing problem in their life. And beloved, they're gripped with fear, and worse yet, they're gripped with hopelessness. The doctor said there's no hope. The lawyer said there's no hope. The so-and-so said there's no hope. I'm stuck with this. I just am going to have to. Well, there is hope with God. And a wise man, a discerning man, knows that there's hope with God. God says this is it, and he's the only one that can say this is it. And we're all going to die, by the way. You have to make peace with that, unless the Lord comes. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this. What is the cause of their dilemma and their double-mindedness? I want you to look at verse 5. He says, if any of you, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And he says, it shall be given them. Do you see it? God says they lack Sophia. Not Sophia Loren. Sophia is the Greek word for wisdom. They don't lack knowledge. It's not that they're lacking schooling or education or training. They don't lack learning or culture or skills, but good old-fashioned wisdom like mama and daddy used to teach you. Come and say amen out there. You see, beloved, so what is wisdom? Well, I'm going to close with this. Wisdom is the right and the proper and intelligent use and application of the facts and knowledge. Beloved, but wisdom, now listen to me, is much more than knowledge uh, or uh, being knowledgeable or informed about the facts of something. Wisdom is the ability to make good, sound, practical decisions based upon proper discernment and judgment through penetrating and perceptive insights into things from knowledge that you may or may not have learned yourself. That somehow, some way, God himself intervened and downloaded this information into my mind and into my soul and into my spirit, and he gave me wisdom, the ability to think outside the box, beyond myself. Now I can discern, now I'm not double-minded anymore, amen? You see, he downloads his divine insights, uh, insights of his infinite mind into us so that we too, like him, can now also, and listen to me, subconsciously and intuitively know and perceive uh, unknown things in our life. I'll never forget one time uh, a preacher gave a testimony they were building a building, and they had to have a special part for the plumbing in them days for the city to give them a permit to keep building. And they didn't know where to get it. And so the builders, uh, the, the um, inspectors said, you can't go beyond this point. Well, they had to go beyond this point because now they've got a budget they have to, uh, to uh, pay for. They have... Uh, people that they have to uh, bring in so they can worship on, uh, what are you going to do with them? They were having them in stadiums, and th there was a lot of things that were involved. So the preacher said this. He said, I didn't know what to do, so I went around behind the building. I got down on my knees, and I asked God. I said, oh, God, boy, you, you know all things. I don't know anything here. Can you help me, God? Can you help me? Oh, God. And then all of a sudden, he said, a picture occurred in his mind, and it was where to get the part. So he went over to the inspector. He said, could we go to Joel's and get the part? 
You know, like he really knew what he was talking about. Was, I'm saying Joel's could be anybody. It'd never be Frank's, but it would be Joel's. Joel, Joel has everything. He's rich. And the inspector said, you know what? That's a brilliant idea. I can approve the permit today. You see, beloved, he didn't know anything. God himself downloaded part of his insights from his infinite mind into this man. He poured it out inside of him. And now he was able to know things and see things he never even thought of. Different perspectives, perspectives different angles of the dangles. Why? Divine wisdom. What did I say? Divine wisdom. What did I say? Divine wisdom. And he became a discerner, not double-minded. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God wants you to be able to comprehend some things. He wants you to be able to look at a situation and say, you know what, I don't know what to do right here, but I know the one who knows what to do. I'm not going to be double-minded. I'm not just going to be uh, dissuaded from the facts because everything seems like it's against me. I know that God has called me to do this. And if God has called me to do this, then He's going to show me the way. He will give me the wisdom. And I want to be discern, uh, discerner. I don't want to be double-minded. You listen to me. When we built this church, from a human perspective, it all looked like we shouldn't do it. But yet God said, I want you to do it. My board said, yes, let's do it. And we just went through a harrowing time. And then God opened up every door. I didn't know how he did it. I even had the banker, imagine he came to my house. And if you know my house, I got a little office upstairs. He even came up my stairs. My stairs are about this wide. It's an old house. And it's like climbing Mount Everest. I mean, it's almost straight up. When my back goes out, I have to come down face down on my belly. I'm serious when I say this to you. I have to come down on my hands and get down to the bottom. And then I say, Ellie, help me up. No, leave me alone right now. Let me sit here a second. But he came up those stairs, and he said, in my, he got in my office, he says, I got a nosebleed. I said, I have one every day. <laughs> and he sat down, and he went through all the things. He says, when do you want the check? Well, I'll, 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 uh, half an hour. <laughs> when do you want the check? <laughs> well, beloved, let me close with this. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at about being a discerner or double-minded. We're going to see what James, what God, speaking through James, has to say. But I want to call your attention to one text before I leave. In verse 17, I always love this text. You can look at it if you want. The Bible says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Amen? God loves to give good gifts under his children. Are you a discerner? Are you double-minded? So afraid of the consequences, you can't make up your mind. Well, beloved, I know someone who can help you. But you have to come to him. Discerner or double-minded? Let's go to the throne.